Okay, so today what we're going to look at is how to incorporate uncertainty into our systems. And also going to take a closer look at utilities and where they come from. So first topic is how to deal with uncertain outcomes. So let's say you're playing this game over here, which we looked at last lecture. And just as a reminder, last lecture we looked at minimax, so what you would do is you would say, well, for the minimizer, um, we choose an option that has 10 over here, an option that has 9 over here, so the value on their minimax would be 9. Uh, sorry, 10. Because top is a maximizer. So what happens is maximizer chooses right, and this is probably the right outcome if you play against a very mechanical system that always makes the right choice. But in the real world, people make mistakes. You could be playing against a robot that looks like this. And in that case, maybe going left is the right thing. Because if they were to make a mistake, you get 100, which is really high. And 9 is only a little bit less than 10. So you might want to take your chances and go left. It might not be a dumb robot, it might just be somebody rolling the dice. And that's what we're going to look at today. Assume the other player just rolls the dice and based on that picks a move. Now moving left could be the right thing. So how do we deal with that? What we'll change is we'll change our minimizer nodes into chance nodes. And the way we denote them is by this circular node over here. That means you are in a way averaging the nodes below you. So this is a chance node, and by chance, you'll go left or right, same here. If that's the case, let's say, let's say every split is 50-50, going left is the right thing, because you have a good chance of giving 100, maybe 9, which is only slightly worse than 10. So how do we run search in this expected max formalism? What's the formalism? We assume rolling dice here. In reality, it doesn't have to be rolling dice. We build a model with which we do computation. Rolling dice is not necessarily what happens. It could be ghosts that just don't act optimally. It could be a stupid player you're playing against that you know will sometimes just make a dumb move, and you then might want to anticipate that. In robotics, what it often is is something where you want your robot to drive up to, to some, let's say, next to a table to grab something. You ask it to drive to next to the table, and it's actually 20 centimeters away from where you ask it to go. And so there's some randomness there, and you've got to account for that and know how to deal with the fact that you can't determine the outcome of your actions. So one way to think of these chance nodes is that there is a player playing the game with you. Another way to think of it is that you choose an action, and after you chose the action, the outcome of the action has not been determined yet. And some randomness will come into play before there's an actual outcome of the action. And that's often how these things come about in reality. In robotics, that's how it comes about. You say, I don't know what's going to happen if I apply this control input. I'm going to model it as an action followed by a chance node. If that's indeed the case, we might not want to compute the minimax value because that's assuming the worst. And it's not the case that always the worst is going to happen. So we'll do something new called expected max search. Sometimes it's actually simpler than the minimax search. The max nodes are the same as before. Chance nodes are now replacing the min nodes, and the outcome is uncertain. And you can cal calculate their expected utilities. And we'll look more closely at what that means. But what that for now means is you just average the numbers that are below that node. OK, let's look at a demo of why we might care about this. Let's first look at minimax in action in a scenario we saw last time. So. This is going to be minimax. What's the scenario? Oh, too soon. OK. What's the scenario here? Pac-Man making one move is a cost of one, so minus one. Winning the game is plus 500 in bonus. Losing the game is minus 500 in bonus. Eating a food pallet is a bonus of 10. Minimax situation, Pac-Man stands no chance to survive here, not even eat any food pellets. So to minimize the cost incurred, the right thing to do is to just dive right into the ghost. Because then you only have a very short time of the minus one, and you're done. So the right minimax thing here 
is to be suicidal. Boom, that's it. All right, it's the right thing. Now, well, don't take that message home. Uh, <laughs> now let's look again. Let's see what happens now. These ghosts are not the worst case enemies. These ghosts are now acting randomly. And so it's possible that the blue one doesn't come to Pac-Man, it's possible it goes away from Pac-Man. We don't know that ahead of time until we have the roll of the dice that decides how the ghosts are going to play. Now, Pac-Man computes a minimax solution to this, assumes the ghosts are minimizing. Solution is the same, right? It doesn't know anything about the fact that the ghosts might not be um, worst case enemies. And we see here, even though the blue ghost runs away, Pac-Man runs right into the orange ghost to suicide as quickly as possible. Expectimax, the formalism we have there, the idea is that you anticipate that there is randomness. You don't know if the blue ghost is gonna run towards you or away from you, but you think, in this case, there's a 50-50 chance towards Pac-Man or not. Based on that 50-50 chance, what is the best action to take, All right? So let's see what happens here after running Expectimax. Same situation. The result of the computation is that you run towards the food pellets, because half the time the blue ghost runs away. If that happens, you get a very high reward. You get over 500 here. And if the blue ghost had run towards you, you would have run into it after two steps instead of running to the, yellow, the orange ghost after one, so the difference would have been very minimal, right? In the bad scenario, you either die after one or after two steps, but in the good scenario, you could have 532. So let's look at the bad scenario, which would happen the other 50% of the time. So minus 502 versus minus 501 in minimax, just slightly worse, but 50% of the time you do a lot better. So that's what you get to exploit in Expectimax if there is randomness in your opponents or if just randomness in the world. So we have the same kind of dispatch function to do the computation a function that computes the value of a state. Now the dispatch chooses between a maximizer node, expected node, or terminal node where it just can read off the utility. We've seen the maximizer node before. This is new, so let's look at that more closely. What's happening in this one here? The expected node. You initialize your value to zero, then you loop. What you do is you keep track of this value of v, and for every successor, you add the value of the successor, but weighted by the probability of that successor being the successor that you'll get in the actual execution. So you get a weighted sum here. Once you've summed over all successors, you return that value. So let's look at an example. Here, there's a weighting of one half, one third, one sixth, and there are some utilities below. There's just an expected node, nothing else. This would result in an average of one half, times eight plus one third times 24 plus one sixth times minus 12, which would give you four plus eight minus two, which is 10, correct. So the value we get up here in this node is 10. That's the expected max value for that particular node. Once we know how to do it for one of these nodes, we can just repeat it everywhere and compute the value of these trees. So here's a spelled out version of the computation. Yes, question. Yes, yeah, so in the, in the example with the Pac-Man and the two ghosts. Yes. Uh, wasn't it like, wasn't it the equal chance that the ghost would come towards the other Pac-Man? So if it's equal for both, then how did it change its behavior? Like if it's one half for both uh, successor. Okay, so let's draw the tree for that particular example. Let's uh, see where we have some space. Okay, we have some space here. Let's draw it here. So for Pac-Man and the ghost, Pac-Man goes first, right? Then it, so that's a maximizer node. Then you have, actually, let's draw it like this, put Pac-Man out here, Pac-Man's layer, then each of the ghosts get to play. Let's just consider the blue ghost, because the orange one is always doing the same thing. 
Um, so the blue ghost gets to play. Pac-Man could go left or right. Then after going left, the situation we're in is the ghost gets to play, the blue one. Um, at this point, the ghost is a chance node, both cases. The ghost could decide to go left or right, left or right. The tree continues under here. But let's draw the outcomes for each one of these four. We know what is going to happen, right, at this layer. If, if the ghost chooses to go left, it means it's tracking down Pac-Man from the left side. Then if Pac-Man went left, actually, wait, we have one more. We have one other move, but we know that, let's assume Pac-Man gets to choose only once, and the ghost gets to choose only once. So once they choose a direction, they stick to it, right? We have left, left. This would be an outcome of Pac-Man would be grabbed after two moves by the blue ghost, which would be minus 502. Um, if the ghost were to go right, it would escape Pac-Man. And we saw then Pac-Man takes a certain set of moves to get all of them, I think eight moves, for a total of plus 532, 40 from the four pallets, minus eight from the moves, and 500 for the win. Then here, going right, we have immediate suicide, essentially. Um, so we'll have actually after one move, we'll end up with minus one from the move and minus 500 from losing the game, so minus 500. And one, and same here, because it's the orange ghost that captures Pac-Man. So over here, we always get minus 501. Here, because they're equal probabilities, we get on the average 15. And so the expect the expected value on the left is 15, on the right is minus 501, and so that's why the move to the left wins here in this set of assumptions. But we made some assumptions, right? We assumed the ghosts are playing randomly or according to this pattern. If that's not true, then it might not work out. Any other questions? Okay, let's do a numerical example then. Let's uh, have each of you take a minute to try to work this out. We've seen how to do an expected node, how to do a maximizer node. Let's see if you can compute the value of this expected max tree. Oh, the probabilities are all one third. One third, one third. Okay, let's, let's round up what we found. For the first node over here, what do we get? I hear eight, all right. How about for the second one here? Four, nice. How about this one? Seven, at the top node. Eight, so what will happen? When this game unfolds, Maximizer will go over here. We'll have an expected value of eight. There's no expectation that Maximize will actually get 8. It'll actually, it's never going to be 8. It's going to be 3, 12, or 9. It's just the expected value. And then randomness will decide what the actual outcome is going to be. How about pruning? We saw alpha, beta pruning at the end of last lecture. Um, actually, one of the hardest things we cover in this class, as you'll find out on the exams. Um, how about for expected max? Can we do pruning here? So there's the same tree as last time. Compute expected value here. This was um, eight. 
Then we're working here. This is two so far. That's all we have seen so far. Can we draw any conclusions? No, we can. A lot of no's, and that's correct. We cannot draw any conclusions yet. Why? When we average things, if somebody throws in an infinity or a negative infinity, you could really throw it off in a very particular direction. All right, so as long as you haven't seen the last one of these, you have no idea what's going in there. So no pruning possible here. No pruning for us. Now, one thing you might want to think about on your own is if sometimes pruning is possible, if you have bounds on the values that can show up here. So what I said is, if somebody throws in a minus infinity or a plus infinity, but that's really extreme, right? If you knew they could only throw in a number between minus three and plus three, maybe you could already draw some conclusions here. And that's how sometimes in practice you can still prune and expect the max. But you need additional information for that to work out. Okay, we can prune. We have very deep trees. We know that's what we end up dealing with in most situations. Um, we have another mechanism to deal with those deep trees, which is to do some bounded horizon search. Rather than searching all the way till the bottom, where we actually know the utilities, stop somewhere. Maybe you can only search up to depth three. And that's it. One move for each of the players. And you have some evaluation function here that says, I think the value here below is going to be 400, 300, and so forth. This is the same type of evaluation function we've seen last time. It's supposed to reflect what the utility will be. In practice, you don't know what it is. So you somehow come up with some function. We saw examples for chess, for Pac-Man, features that you might incorporate, and then you weight those features, and with the right weighting, you might get a good evaluation of that state. Once you do that, you can bound it somewhere, and you can do your search even for an infinitely deep game. Now, what utilities to use? In Minimax, um, the utilities play a big role because that's what you end up with. But in Expectamax, actually, the exact choice plays even a bigger role. Let's say we do this here, low comparison. We still have, let's rank them. We have rank one, rank two, rank three, rank four. If you go from bottom to top, rank one, rank two, rank three, rank four. So if you were to run minimax, you would do the same thing in both trees. Because all you do is compare values, and if they're higher or lower is what matters for your outcome. All we did here is squaring the entries. And now let's take a look at what expected max would do. So minimax, we know, would go for um, this branch, this branch. That's minimax. Now expect to max, let's change colors. Green. Expect to max. Circle here, circle here. We get, let's say it's equal, 20 and 25. So we also go here. And here we get 800. And we get um, 650. Thank you. So we will go this way. So by just squaring the utilities at the bottom of this tree, we get a different outcome. So we see is that when we do expected max, we're much more sensitive to exactly how we define our utilities because we're going to average them, not just compare them one to the other. So that's something important, and the second half of lecture will all be dedicated to how we come up with utilities and what they formally are. But keep this in mind that for expected max, monotonic transformations could influence the outcome. For minimax, monotonic transformations will not influence the outcome of your uh, minimax search. Okay, so we'll see in the second half lecture how we get our utilities. Let's look at the probabilities now. In Minimax, we didn't have to worry about the probabilities. Here we now will. Question. Okay, utilities. When we say utility, for now what it is, is the value associated with the end state of a game. So every end state of the game, we associate a value with the very bottom of the tree, and that's the utility of that outcome. It's a number. And we'll see what that number might mean in the second half of lecture. The other new thing in these expected max trees is probabilities. And in fact, um, starting next lecture, for 10 lectures running, we'll be doing probability every single lecture. 
can be a lot of probability. That's why there was a self-diagnostic at the beginning of the course. But we'll look a little bit at them right now, because we already need them just a little bit. So, in probability theory, we have random variables, and they represent variables that can have multiple outcomes, a lot like a variable in a CSP, right, it can have multiple outcomes. But there's a weight associated with each of the outcomes, and that reflects how often we expect that to be the outcome if we got to see the random variable instantiated multiple times. So let's look at an example. You can think of traffic on the freeway as a random variable. It could be that there is no traffic at all, as you see over here. Could be light traffic, or could be heavy traffic. And the idea here is that we don't know what the traffic is like on the freeway. Let's say right now on 880, we don't know what the traffic is like, and we could pause the probability distribution that allows us to reason about the traffic there even though we don't know what it really is. And we say, well, maybe 25% chance no traffic, 50% chance light traffic, 25% chance heavy traffic. That might be completely wrong. For 880, it's for sure wrong. You might want to put 90% heavy traffic, 9% light, and 1% zero or something. Um, that's up to you. You have to come up with these probabilities, and we'll see how we get them. Um, in the next 10 lectures, essentially, we'll do a lot of that. Now, a very important thing to keep in mind about these probabilities when you come up with them is that they could change. Probably for traffic being heavy, it could maybe be 20% for a quiet road when you have no other information. But once additional information comes in, you know it's 8 in the morning, peak commute time, the probability could have changed. And actually, a lot of what we'll look at in the lecture 3 forward till 12-ish forward is how to deal with this kind of new information coming in and how to update our probability estimates when there are lots of random variables that are in play. But for now, for today, we'll assume that we have the probabilities. But keep that in mind, there'll be a big topic going forward. Probabilities themselves, we know they have to be non-negative, and we know they always have to sum to one. Just, it's a set of numbers that sums to one that's positive. That's a constraint for one random variable. Okay. Now what we do with them is we compute expectations in these expected max trees. And so what does that mean is, well, example, how long to get to the airport? Well, we don't know, but it could depend on what kind of traffic. And for each type of traffic, there could be a different duration. And then we take the weighted sum of these durations to get the expected time it'll take to get to the airport. So that's the principle we'll use today. Just weighted averages. Any questions about that? Okay, great. Now what probabilities are we going to use? Expected max search, if you're given an expected max tree and we annotate them, that's great, you can do your computation. But in practice, you need to model something from the real world. If it's a roll of a die, maybe you have a uniform distribution over all outcomes. Um, often it's more complicated. You might be modeling a person and you might be modeling their typical choices in some way. Um, it could be a chance node modeled by the environment or maybe by an opponent. And it could be something kind of tricky where it says, oh, this person is, is an adversary, and most of the time they'll play against me, but sometimes they're just out of it, and they make a random action. All right, then you get a pretty complicated distribution about what they might be doing. So very, various things could influence what you put there. But for now, for the remainder of the lecture, we assume the probability fairy gives them to us, and that's how the problem is solved. Very easy for now. It's gone. <laughs> okay, we'll actually do a quiz where it doesn't come to our help, and you're gonna have to come up with the probabilities yourself. Let's think about the following problem. You are running a search for playing a game, you're the maximizer, and your opponent is running depth two minimax. You know that, they're running minimax depth two. Then 80% of the time they use that result, but they feel like they're too predictable if they were to always use that result, and so 20% of the time, they make a random move. How do you put this into a game tree that you can solve for your optimal moves? Let's take a minute for you to chat with your neighbors and see what you come up with.
Okay, let's see what, what you came up with. Who wants to uh, express their answer? Any suggestions? We might do here. Lots of quietness. No hands up. Guess I'll do it. Um, what search are we going to use? We're going to use expected max search. And here's how it's going to work. You have a tree like this. After you make your move, there's a chance node. Why is there a chance node? Because 80% chance one thing's going to happen, 20% chance another thing's going to happen. The 20% chance is very easy to model. It's a random move. We know how to model that. For the 80% chance, we actually need to do a lot of computation. We don't know what that move is going to be. We actually have to, inside this search, run another search, some kind of inception, like the dream in a dream kind of thing. <laughs> and inside that search for that chance node right there, you're running another search. That search is a depth to minimax search. That search will tell you what the depth to minimax outcome is for that player. Starts with a minimizer at the top here. That will tell you 80% chance this is the move. And then 20% chance it will be randomly chosen from all the others. Okay, so that's how it works. This could get much more complicated. Much more complicated. You could go on and on and on with this. You could say, well, my opponent's running a depth two, it's not just running a depth two minimax, they are running a depth four minimax, they're running a search of depth four, but they assume that I'm running a search of depth two, where 20% uh, of the time I make a random move, right? Or it could even continue from there and so forth. So you can make repeated assumptions and keep going forever. This can get very, very complicated. The only way out of this kind of where things don't get that complicated is with the expected max assumptions, straight up, just random moves or some distribution, or minimax. If you, if you assume the other person is playing optimal minimax, and they assume you're playing optimal minimax, and so forth, that repetition doesn't infuse these repeated tree dreams. Instead, it's just one tree, the original tree that you can work with. All right, so that's, that's why often minimax might still be your weapon of choice, even if you think Maybe they're doing something more complicated because it's complicated procedures. You have to start doing searches within searches within searches. And for minimax, that's not the case and can be a lot cheaper. But keep this in mind. This is all possible within the formalism we're looking at. Expect the max can handle this. In a very special case, expect the max could even handle minimax. You could say, with 100% chance, they make the optimal move according to minimax and 0% chance they make not the optimal move with respect to minimax. It's a very special case of expect the max where it starts coinciding with minimax. Okay, so that's how it works. Searches within searches. Um, Code-wise, of course, it's not too hard to implement. It's just repeated calls, but the running time will be really, really long. So the big deal here is how are we modeling the world? We've seen minimax, we've seen expected max, we've seen the search within a search. Um, what should we do? Some people are optimistic, some people are pessimistic. Um, there are pros and cons to both. What if you're very optimistic? Well, the real world isn't always favorable to you. And if you're very optimistic, what might happen is you just always walk into the dangerous spots. You get mugged every time you go out because you're, you're not afraid of all these guys that are going to mug you. All right? Very optimistic. Now, if you're very pessimistic, you get the opposite type of behavior. You might be walking around and you see little bunny, and you're scared, because you think that's vampire bunny, right? And there's no way for you to know, really, right? If you're pessimistic, it's always possible that the worst case scenario is going to happen. It's always possible that the guy who stopped at the red light and you're crossing decides to push that pedal and run over you, right? So 
being pessimistic, being minimax, is really tough, because you end up kind of being able to do nothing, right? Because it's always possible something goes wrong. And so the minimax value of pretty much anything is gonna be really, really bad. It'll always be that you die. On the other hand, being very optimistic is not great either, because then you might run into a lot of problems. So you need some kind of right trade-off there. You need to do the right thing. So what you need to do is, is somehow match the models that you make to the world and kind of get them to work well. So let's take a look at a couple of scenarios here. We'll look at, we can simulate this. We have a Pac-Man game here. We have just one food pellet, one Pac-Man, one ghost. And what we'll look at first here is, you play Minimax Pac-Man with an adversarial ghost. That's a standard scenario from last lecture. And we'll look at how these games play out in a second, but let's look at the statistics for now. We ran this five times, we saw that Pac-Man won five out of five with an average score of 483. That's pretty good. The other standard thing we've looked at is if the ghosts were random, then we say let's run Expectamax, which is over here, and we get an average score of 503, win five out of five. Why do we get more here than for an adversarial ghost? Well, we're in a better world. Right? If the ghost is not adversarial, it's kind of random, we can expect to do better. We're not being worked against as much as in the adversarial ghost scenario. We can also mix and match. We can see what happens, for example, when you run expect a max when there's an adversarial ghost. Now you win only one out of five. Because you're way too optimistic. You think the ghost is going to randomly move, but then the ghost actually might intentionally snatch you here. The ghost will. And you get a pretty poor outcome. Then here, we have a random ghost and play minimax, so we are very pessimistic about the ghost behavior, but we see that in this case, being pessimistic is not hurting us too much. If we had been playing expectamax, we'd have 503 on the average, now 493. So in this particular scenario, minimax was maybe the right thing to do, because you didn't lose a whole lot by playing minimax. And you just lost a little bit, but if you don't know how the ghost is playing, in both cases, it works out pretty well. If you play Expectamax, it's great if the ghost is indeed random, but if the ghost is against you, coming out really bad. Let's take a look at what this behavior actually looks like. If you run this. So this is a random ghost running Expectamax and the Pac-Man running Expectamax. See what happens? Very easy. The ghost just walked away from the food pellet, Pac-Man eats it, done. Here's an adversarial ghost running Minimax. That's a standard scenario from last lecture. The ghost is kind of chasing Pac-Man. There we go. Pac-Man wins. Pac-Man has to go all the way around because the ghost is chasing it. Is this a good Minimax ghost? Well, we know it's not searching all the way till the end of the game, right? It would never have chased track down Pac-Man if it could search all the way till the end of the game, it would have guarded the food pellet, right? But some, at some depth limit, the best this ghost can do with Minimax is chase Pac-Man, and Pac-Man ends up winning. And here, an adversarial ghost playing against Pac-Man, and Pac-Man assumes it's a random ghost and plays Expectamax. So it moves close to the pellet, not working out. It's being chased, but the depth of the ghost search is not that deep, and so you still come out victorious in this particular case. So you get really lucky here. That's the one out of five wins in that scenario. Now here's what the pessimism could look like when the world isn't against you, but you assume it's against you. So you run minimax for Pac-Man, but the ghost is actually playing random. <laughs> it's not daring to make its move because the ghost is still too close. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> the ghost is random. So at some point, this ghost got to move away from that foot pellet. Oh, <laughs> uh, now he knows. <laughs> so that's what happens if you're very pessimistic and you're kind of unlucky. Yes. If it is, 
Say that again. You said that expect the Max could win one of the games. Um, if they go Let's go back. Let's go back. Let's see here. Um, the one out of five here. Yeah. Let's see. How is that possible? If the goes to the adversarial and Pac-Man plays expect max what would happen, it's probably a tie-breaking thing. Um, because Pac-Man's strategy would be fixed, and the ghost, it's either an initialization thing where the ghost gets initialized in different spots, or a tie-breaking thing. You're right. Good observation. What are some other game types? We've seen games with an adversary, we've seen games with a chance node in it. What else do we have? You can have games where there is a lot more going on, where they all play together. So backgammon is an example. In backgammon, you play against somebody else, but each of you also rolls dice. You roll the dice, that's a chance, no chance node. Then you make a move, that's a maximizer node. Then there's a chance node, because the other person rolls the dice. Then the other person makes a move, which is a minimizer node, and so forth. So we get an interleaving of these three types of nodes. Not a problem for the hours we've seen. You just have the dispatch node, check what kind of node you're at, and then do the computation accordingly. So we can handle this, no problem. A um, little bit of history about backgammon. So backgammon um, is a harder game in some sense than the games we've looked at, in the sense that the branching factor is very large. You get this roll of the dice before you even choose a move. So after the roll, there's the roll of the dice, many possible outcomes, and then you gotta pick a move, and that's one player playing. So there's a lot of branching happening. Um, can be a, it's a pretty deep game. So those are downsides of trying to solve backgammon. The upside is that due to the randomness, searching very deep might not help you as much. Because it's really hard to predict what would happen, and you're kind of searching all these branches that are maybe pretty unlikely, and you're not getting a whole lot from that. So it is possible to build reasonably good backgammon players with a relatively shallow search. In fact, the first kind of famous board game that was where AI was actually the winner, the, the world champion, is backgammon. And we'll see more about that when we see reinforcement learning, but essentially use the depth to search. That was it, use the depth to search, really good features to evaluate a board situation, and then the weights, the way it summed together the features to get the evaluation function, those weights were learned through reinforcement learning. And doing that, it was able to become the world champion. So we'll look at that three or four lectures from today, um, how that exactly works. There are other types of games, very different from what we've seen so far. So far we've always assumed that there is one number at the bottom. Even if there are two players, we assume there is one number at the bottom, because the implicit assumption was that if the number is, let's say, plus five, the maximizer gets plus five, but the minimizer will get minus five, and because it's the opposite number, you don't need to keep track of it. The minimizer is just minimizing the number that the maximizer gets. In general, when there's multiple players, it doesn't have to be the case that their utility is summed to zero, and if there's three players, you have to show all of them to know what the utilities are. And so what we have here is, for this particular outcome of the game, we have utility of one for red, six for blue, six for green. Now how does this play out? Well, when you look at what happens in this node over here, green chooses between two outcomes, and just looks at the green number, because that's the only thing that matters for green. Six is better, so green would choose to go here. If you're evaluating this node over here, again, green only considers the green number, so green would pick this one over here. Once you have those, six, one, two, and one, six, six, blue can make its choice. Blue would get a one over here and a six over there, so blue would go over here, one, six, six, and so forth. So that's how we do the propagation in the multiplayer games. Every node, you look at which player is making the decisions and just look at that player's utility values. You can get pretty complicated behavior this way. If you look at this part of the tree, you say of all these outcomes, what would be good for green and blue? Well, six, six. That's really good for green and blue. And indeed, you get that behavior out where the game will go down this path here. So you get collaboration out of green and blue because the utilities are aligned, naturally. So you get something like this, where green and blue are nicely working together, red is the other player. 
And on the other side here, if you look carefully, you'll see that green and blue are actually playing against each other. Green is good here, blue is good here, and then blue good here, but green over here. So they're playing against each other the same way we've already seen. It's almost like a minimax scenario in that subtree. Not exactly because they don't have the opposite utilities, but close. So if you have these multiple utilities, you can get all types of behavior out depending on how you define your utilities for the outcomes, and it'll automatically come out of your specification of this game tree. You don't have to hard code blue and green collaborate on the left side. No, it'll just come out of it automatically. Okay, let's take a break here, and after the break, let's take a look at what utilities really are and where we get them from. All right, so utilities. We've been using them, but we've assumed they're given to us, and in practice, they might not be. We know roughly what they reflect. They reflect some preference, right? This utility table over here could say, ice cream is preferable over candy, is preferable over a cat, is preferable over a dog, which is not preferable over a balloon. Um, the flower is kind of the lowest preference here, and that's, this would be some form of utility table, right? That's the intuition we've had so far, but let's, let's dig a little deeper and see what they really are. First of all, why are we even averaging them? Why is it even meaningful to average things, right? You can't average a cat and a dog. How are you gonna average the utilities associated with them and assume that something as nice is gonna come out of it? Why not just run minimax? Well, we know why we don't just run minimax. It's the whole idea that if you're too pessimistic, always something can go wrong, and pretty much for every scenario, the outcome's gonna be, well, I'm gonna die, it doesn't matter what I'm gonna do, right? So that's why we still care about expected max. Now, the principle we'll look at, and that we looked at the very first lecture when we weren't technical at all, was that this class is really about maximum expected utility. We said that's what it's about. And now today we'll know what that means. We, knows, we know what it is to maximize our expected utilities. We just don't know yet where these utilities come from. So right now we'll look at where do they come from? How do we know they even exist? How can you put a number on a cat and a dog and then average those, right? Um, and what behavior will be prescribed by these utilities? So what they are, they're functions from outcomes. This could be outcomes of a game, but in general, they're outcomes in the world. And they, they describe an agent's preferences. And the higher the number, the more preferred. In a game, it could be very simple. You care about winning or losing. Winning is plus one, losing is minus one. A tie is zero, let's say. There you have your utilities, and you're all set. For real world outcomes, it's a lot harder to come up with the numbers. And that's what we're going to look at. But there is a the theorem there that says that any rational preferences, and we'll formalize what that means, can be summarized as a utility function. This theorem is saying that if you are rational, we can associate for every individual person, it can be different from person to person, but every person has a number for every outcome. That number reflects how much they like that outcome that's the utility, and then you can run an expected max for that person, and that prescribes their rational behavior. Why do we care? Um, you might say, why do we care about utilities? It goes back a lot to what we saw in the second lecture, where we said, why do we care about search to find paths? At the end of the day, yes, all we need is a behavior, but specifying utilities is often a lot easier than specifying a whole behavior, because the behavior, how Pac-Man should behave, depends on the context, where the ghosts are, where the foot pellets are, and so forth. Whereas utility function can be a lot simpler to specify in many cases. Um, okay, so we need the utilities. Then why are we still specifying the utilities? Why not say, agent, it's your search, your thing, you specify your utilities. Well, things could really go wrong. Imagine you have a vacuum cleaning agent, right? And you say, you specify your utilities. And the vacuum cleaning agent says, I like sitting still, maximum utility for non-moving, not even sucking anything. Okay, now, it runs its expected max search as you tell it to do to be rational, and what it does is just sitting there. No vacuum ever happens, right? That's the problem, but achieving very high utility, just not the utility you care about. So that's why we want to specify the utilities. We want to prescribe what is desired, and then the agent will compute how to achieve that. It's not necessarily trivial to do this. You could say, oh, the vacuum agent, trivial. Whenever you suck up some dirt, plus one. 
there's my utility. Actually, not necessarily going to work. That vacuum cleaner agent could decide, in its expected max search, doing the rational optimal thing, that the right thing to do is to dump a lot of dirt, followed by sucking up some dirt and then dumping it again. Because you give a reward every time it sucks up some dirt. So you have to be very careful how you specify these utilities so you get the totally the, the behavior that you don't like, even though your agent is rational. Now let's look at ice cream cones, right? Probably you want two scoops over one scoop over zero scoops. That's a natural thing to prefer. Let's make it a little more complicated. You're going to get ice cream. Now you finally make it to the front of the line and you now decide, get a single scoop or a double scoop. You waited 100 people ahead of you. Um, single, single scoop, sure, quite happy. Double scoop, well, sure. But what if you drop it? <laughs> Much more likely with a double scoop. But yeah, there's a chance that you're lucky. You managed to balance it and you got your double scoop ice cream. So now it becomes more complicated. Because now what we really have to do is we have to associate somehow utilities with a double scoop that could fall off or could be retained versus a single scoop. Right? And we know that from earlier in lecture that the numbers we put at the bottom here matter. We said if you put some number here, A, B, and C, what we saw is for minimax, just the ordering of the numbers matters. But for expected max, if we were to square those numbers, which would keep the ordering intact, we could get a different outcome. So it's not just a matter of knowing what you prefer. We all prefer the view over the happy with one scoop versus the drop ice cream. We know that C is better than A is better than B. But we need to know exactly how much better. We need to have a number. Otherwise, expect the max can't do the right thing. Just knowing that relationship is not enough. OK, so we need to deal with lotteries, something where two outcomes are possible, stochastically determined. And so we have, let's say, two possible prizes, A and B. And a lottery between A and B has a probability associated with it. Probability P, you have outcome A, probably 1 minus P, outcome B. It's important to keep in mind here is that you're not playing some kind of state lottery or something. This is just a concept that you land in a chance node, and in that chance node, something's going to happen to you. You're going to get outcome A or B, and there are probabilities associated with it. So that's what it looks like. If you know your prize, it just looks like this, and here, that's the lottery. We'll have some notation. We'll say if A is preferred over B, we'll write it this way. And if you're indifferent between them, we'll have this quiggly sign between them. OK. Now, we have lotteries, we have outcomes. Let's start looking at what is the rational thing to do here. So what we're saying is that we're going to come up with utilities, numbers for every possible outcome. And the first thing we're going to do is to say, what does it mean for these utilities to be rational? Any set of numbers you associate with, with the outcomes is a utility function. Just some of them are more meaningful than others. And we're interested in the ones that are meaningful, where it's actually meaningful for an agent to have those utility functions. We'll call those rational, rational utility functions. Here's the first axiom. We posit this. We say, if this is not true about your utility function, it's not a rational utility function. This is the axiom of transitivity. It says that if you prefer A over B and B over C, then you must prefer A over C. Seems to make sense, right? It would be weird to have preferences that are not that way, but that's, that's what we're going to define. This is an axiom that says this has to be true to be a rational preference, one of many that we'll see. Why? Why is this really meaningful? Consider this scenario here. An agent doesn't satisfy this. What does that mean? Prefers, our weird agent prefers A over B and B over C, but then also C over A. Violating the action. Well, what does that mean? Well, if they prefer B over C, then the agent with C would pay, let's say, one cent to get B instead of C. Spend one cent, move from C to B. Well, if they prefer A to B, then they'd be happy to pay one cent, let's say, if that's the difference in preference, to get A instead of B. Now they have A. If they then prefer C over A, then they're again happy to pay a cent to get C instead of A. What's happened? They went around, got back to having C, just C, and having spent three cents. So anytime you run into an agent that doesn't satisfy this action, you could make money of them. Just go around and lose, <laughs> right? 
So you don't want to design your agents, definitely not ones that play with your money to behave this way. There are five axioms you'll work with. Orderability says that either you prefer A over B, or B over A, or you're indifferent between them. So you have to make up your mind, is what that says. Transitivity is what we just looked at. Continuity um, brings in the probabilities. So we say here, if A is preferred over B, preferred over C, then there exists some probability so that the lottery between A and C, which are the two extremes, is equivalent to just B. Because B lies in the middle between A and C, so some probabilistic trade-off between A and C should be equivalent to B. Substitutability, oh, it's not to that yet, we need two more. Um, substitutability, what that means is if A and B are equivalent, then if you have two lotteries where the only thing that changes is swapping A for B, then those lotteries must also be equivalent. Lastly, monotonicity. What that says is A is better than B, then in the context of a lottery here, if you have a higher probability on A here, P is larger than Q, so probability of A is larger here than here, you should prefer that. Those are five actions. You don't necessarily need to agree with them, but those are the actions that a lot of people agree on that are rational things to assume, and if your preference relationship so if you're asked what do you prefer between two prizes or between two lotteries and so forth, satisfies these actions, then we give it the stamp of rationality. Your preference relationship. Yes? Okay, the squiggly line means equivalent. So what that means is that you're, just say these are equally good. It's just a piece of notation. It, just a definition. So for example here, A squiggly line B means that A and B are equivalent, and then what it's saying is that if you had a choice between two lotteries <coughs> with the same probabilities, one minus P for C, and then P for A or P for B, because A and B are equivalent, these two lotteries should be equivalent to you. So this is saying these two lotteries have to be equivalent if A and B are equivalent. Now here's the beauty. Assuming you're willing to work with these actions, you can prove, there's a theorem that says, if you have rational preferences, then you can describe your behavior and the, these preferences with a, with a utility function. So a function that gives a number for every possible outcome, every possible lottery, and that one number will, when it's higher, will be means it's preferred, lower means it's less preferred, and exactly match your preferences. So what this means is that for no matter what problem, if you're willing to make these assumptions, there exists a utility function that corresponds to whatever the preferences are in that context. And what's true about this is that then the utility of a lottery, the utility of a lottery is just the weighted average of the utility of the outcomes. That's what the theorem says. If you're willing to make these five assumptions, there exists a utility function associating a number with every outcome. And for lotteries, you can just average, and this will all be consistent with your preferences. It's a very strong result. It means that by working with utilities, averaging them, and so forth, we're really doing the right thing. We haven't yet said how we find utility numbers, but we now know they exist if we're willing to assume rationality. So maximum expected utility, what that means now is you somehow find those numbers and you run your expected max and you're doing the right thing. That's rational behavior, that's what we looked at in lecture one. Does that mean an agent has to run expected max and work with utilities to be rational? Doesn't have to. The problem could be so simple that you could hard code some behavior in your agent that happens to coincide with the rational behavior and then you can't distinguish, right? If the behavior is the same, can't distinguish is still rational behavior. But one way to get there consistently is to do expect a max over your utilities. All right, so how about human utilities? How do we find these utilities? Because that's in the end of the day usually what we care about. You design a robot, you want to make sure these robots' utilities for outcomes match your utilities so the robot does the right thing, right? We'll look at this more. So one way to do it is to say we work with normalized utilities. Come up with the numbers. 
you say, there's the best possible outcome, the worst possible outcome, we give them one and zero, and everything in between we have to give a number. You just say, give me a number, and that's it. And now you have your utilities. It can be hard to do. Um, often, to simplify things, even though it doesn't matter what the scale is of your utility, if you multiply with a positive constant, expect the max will do the same thing. Um, often, by working the right scale, often a very morbid scale, you can elicit more accurate utilities from people. So let's say you might consider recalling a product because there might be something wrong with it. What you might do is while well, you say, well, what's a, you count micromorts. A micromort is one millionth of a chance of death. And you start counting in those. You say, well, instead of saying utility is 0 0.1, you say the utility is this many micromorts. And you put everything on the micromort scale. And that way you can start comparing them and giving, putting on one scale, and you have your utility values. Very similar one is quality adjusted life years. This is often important in medical decisions. You might undergo a surgery, and that might allow you to live longer, but the quality of that life might maybe be less because there are some side effects of the surgery versus not doing the surgery and dying for sure a year from now, but living your normal life for, the, for that year that's left. Well, normal. Uh, we'll see. Okay, now the beauty is that for utilities, the way it works out is that what you can always do is transform them this way and the relationships stay intact. Because the weighted average interacts nicely with just rescaling and adding a constant. This is the only transformation you can do in utilities, but it's also the one that allows you to pick your scale, whatever is easiest for you to work with, to get the utilities from someone and to then kind of be able to run expected max for them and prescribe what they should do. K1 here has to be positive for this to be true, right? Otherwise, you're just flipping the sign. That wouldn't be good. Okay, now, how do we get the numbers? Okay, here's one way to get the numbers. You say, there's something really good, something really bad. What's... Essentially, you play this kind of game. You say, you're going to spin this wheel. Small region means you get killed right away. The remainder region means that you get to stay alive. Right. So one outcome is the best possible. U plus, you stay alive. Let's say that's, that's the best possible outcome. U minus is the worst outcome is you get killed instantly. And then... To assess how good something is, you essentially see how it trades off against that, right? Spinning the wheel, depending on the probability of having the death, you can say the probability of death is a number, and that'll be a number between zero and one. That's the number I'm working with, and I'm gonna put everything else on the same scale. So I'm gonna put everything on the scale of what would you rather do? Would you rather have $30, or would you rather play this game where you have a 10% chance of being instantly dead, <laughs> All right? $30, maybe um, you're happy to part with a $30, so we know that $30 is worth less than 10% chance of death. Right? <laughs> so that's how you do it. For every possible thing in the world, you compare it to spinning this wheel with different values of P, and that way you can put everything on the same scale. And that's your utility scale between 0 and 1, and you're done. Okay, so pay 30 versus... You know, no change or instant death, that's what we discussed. And if you find a number, P, where you're indifferent between them, you say, I'm equally happy to spin this wheel, as to part with $30, that value of P, that's the utility of $30 for you. Okay? You can all now compute your P for this and know what your utility is for $30. Okay. So, for ma many people, maybe it's like one in a million chance or something, who knows? Um, Hopefully a little lower than that. Now, how about money? You could say money is this universal thing that we use to exchange goods. Why can't we just use money for utility values, right? We actually can. It's not true that we can use money for utility values, but we'll start looking at how we can work with money into the equation here. Let's say you're given a lottery between X dollars and Y dollars. All right. What is the utility of that lottery? Well, we know how to compute the utility of a lottery like that. It's given by an equation that looks like this. Probability P times 
utility of x plus 1 minus p times utility of y. What's important to notice, it's not equal to this thing over here, which is just computing, computing the expected money you'd get and then taking the utility of that. That's not necessarily the same. Typically, it's lower. So typically, we have that for a lottery, the value of the lottery is lower than the utility of the expected monetary value. Why is that? Let's, let's draw a graph here. Let's actually look at money versus utility. Let's money versus utility. We know that we can always shift utilities by a constant offset and rescale them by a positive factor. So we can assume that the utility for zero dollars is zero. So we'll have the graph run through here, make it convenient. Now what happens? Let's say you have more money. Your utility typically, almost anybody, utility will go up. So the typical thing is you have something that goes up. Right. Let's say you were here and you had one million. Utility definitely much higher than for zero dollars because you have probably a more convenient life. If anything, you could always give it away, right? Um, now, anybody would be happy with an extra million, right? Be good. What if you already had a billion dollars? If you already had a billion dollars, let's say you're somewhere all the way out here on the graph, you already have one billion dollars which maybe is somewhere up here, getting the extra one million, would you still go up by this much? Would you still have that much of an increase of utility? Probably not. You're like, I already have a billion. What's a million now? It's pretty much nothing anymore. You're like, an extra million here would increase this much. All right. And that's the behavior you get to see overall, is the more you already have, the less additional money is going to increase your utility. And you get a curve that looks like this. How about the other side? Um, actually, before we do that, let's draw something here. So what is this saying here? This is saying the utility of a lottery is lower than the utility of expected monetary value. Let's say you had a lottery between um, half a million and a million. You'd have here and here. We draw the straight line between these two. We see that that straight line runs underneath the curve. And that's geometrically the same statement. It's saying the straight line outcome here between those two points is showing for different lotteries between a half million and a million what your expected utility is going to be. Your expected utility lies between the utility for half a million and a million on the line between them. Let's take a different color. Um, in color purple, here's where expected utility lives on this line. Because it's a utility. So it connects the two utilities. You have two possible outcomes. Outcome of half a million, outcome of a million. The expected utility, depending on the lottery, will be an average between the two of them, some weighted average. Now, the expected monetary value, if you were, let's say, in the middle, over here at 0.75, would put you above here on the curve, in terms of utility. So the utility of the expected monetary value, the utility of 0.5 times 0.5, I guess, plus 0.5 times 1, we see is larger than 0.5 times the utility of 0.5 plus 0.5 times the utility of 1. What that is really saying is that people are risk averse, that people tend to prefer a certainly getting a certain amount of money over a lottery between certain amounts of money. Now, when you're in depth, what happens on the other side of the curve empirically is that this continues a little bit like that, but then it starts leveling off the other way. And what's happening there is that you say, well, 
once I'm down a billion, I might as well be down 10 billion. I mean, it starts mattering less and less how much you go down. Okay, so that's here, that one here is actually an empirical curve based on data collected from quizzing people about their utility values. Now the fact that you are not certain, that you have a different preference depending on whether things are stochastic or certain comes into play for insurance. What that means is that insurance companies can make money while you actually get a higher utility value thanks to being insured. So it's a win-win situation for the insurance company and for you. How does that work? Let's say you have a lottery between 1,000 and zero. Expected monetary value is just the weighted average, 500. What's the certainty equivalent value? Certainty equivalent value is the average of the utilities of these quantities. So we need to know what the utilities are, right? And then, so we need to compute the utilities for these, average them, we know what the utility is for the lottery, and then we can see what amount of money would have the same utility. So what's the computation? For most people, it comes out to 400. What is this saying? It's saying that certain equivalent value is 400, saying that the utility of 400 is the same as the utility, if we just call this one L, utility of L. That's what it's saying. Most people prefer our ambivalent between 400 for sure versus a lottery 50-50 between zero and 1,000. Okay, the difference is the insurance premium. That difference is what you are willing to pay for an insurance company to take away the randomness out of your life. Because the insurance company takes away the randomness in terms of what you own. Something gets stolen, they replace it. And because you prefer that certainty, you prefer, let's say, $401 for sure over a lottery between zero and a thousand, the insurance company can charge you $100 for you to switch from this lottery here to be guaranteed to have $400. That's what they do. Why is the insurance company happy with that? Why don't they mind this kind of risky setting? For them, it's not risky. They insure so many people, and because of the law of large numbers, it'll just average out. For them, it's not random anymore. Once you do a billion coin tosses, it's going to be really, really close to half of them being head, half of them being tail. So the randomness is essentially gone for them. Okay. So that's how insurance works. They take away the lottery, and you're happy with that. I'll take a question after lecture, because I want to do one more slide, and otherwise we'll run out of time. Okay, are humans rational? Well, here's a famous example, and we'll see if we are rational, okay? What do you prefer between these two lotteries? 80% chance 4K, 20% chance nothing, or 100% chance 3K, and... 0% chance, nothing. Who chooses A? Couple of people, four, five, six, maybe 10. Who chooses B? Majority chooses B, all right. We'll assume we chose B. Now, we have a new lottery system. We're gonna choose between C and D. In C, we have a 20% chance of 4,000, 80% chance of nothing. In D, we have a 25% chance of 3,000. 75% chance of zero. Okay, who chooses C? Most people choosing C, it seems. Who chooses D? Okay, so a little more split on this one, but the vast majority is still going with C. Okay, let's see what just happened here in our choices. All right, we'll do a little calculation that we're not gonna be necessarily too happy with. So most people, prefer B over A, C over D. That was already on the slide ahead of time. <laughs> you, you are in accordance with most people. Okay. But if the utility at zero is zero, which we can always do because we can always rescale and shift, B over A means the utility of 3,000 is higher than 0.8 times the utility of 4,000. Now if we do a little bit of math, the second choice, C over D means that 0.8 times the utility of 4K is higher than the utility of 3K. How do we get there? We got there from first saying 0.2 utility 4K is higher than 0.25 utility of 3K. And we multiplied with, let's see, 4 times 4, we get 0.8 and we get 1.0. So what do we get here? We essentially get a contradiction. We get twice the same quantities, but the B 
bigger than sign is pointing the other way. What does that mean? Our choice was irrational. Between these two things, our choice was irrational. Or was it? Well, there's another explanation. Another explanation is that maybe these choices weren't spelled out properly. I said, what would you choose, right, between these outcomes? And we computed utilities. But why, why did you really prefer B over A, you think? Guaranteed, you have a guarantee, right? So what you could argue, and many people argue, is wrong about what I put on the slide here is that I didn't model the outcome right. The outcome is not choosing between B and A. For A, A sure, this is your outcome in terms of money, but what is also part of your outcome is that you could have chosen B. You could have had a, you had that possibility to guarantee yourself $3,000 and you let it slip. And so part of the outcome is not just the money, but you just being really mad at yourself <laughs> and saying, that was stupid. I should have picked the other option. And your, your regret is what explains your choices. So this is just to illustrate that rationality actions, yes, make a lot of sense, and utilities make a lot of sense, but be careful about how you model the world or things will not work out for you. Okay, next time we'll look at more uncertainty. <laughs>